In spring of 1886, a law was passed by the Prussian Parliament and the Prussian House of Lords that marked a turning point on how the significant Polish minority in Prussia was treated and that would have long-lasting effects on Polish-German relations. This law, titled Law Concerning the Promotion of German Settlements in the Provinces of West Prussia and Polson, was the basis on which the so-called Prussian Settlement Commission was founded. Situated in the city of Poznan, or Posen, the Settlement Commission was tasked with fundamentally changing the ethnic composition of Prussia's eastern provinces by following a strict policy of Germanization. It was an expensive and very controversial venture, and one that ultimately achieved the exact opposite of its starting goal, as it only made the Polish national movement stronger. In today's video, we're going to look at why the Settlement Commission was founded, how it worked, and why it failed. Additionally, we will also talk about the village of Gohlenhofen, which was considered a model settlement and was used to demonstrate the progress of Germanization. Prussia had been a state with quite a considerable Polish minority since the second half of the 18th century, mainly in the provinces of Silesia, West Prussia and Polson. Keeping control over these newly gained lands proved to be a massive challenge. With the spreading of nationalistic thoughts in the 19th century, several armed uprisings occurred within Prussia or in the neighbouring areas of the other partitioning powers with the explicit goal of bringing back an independent Polish state. None of them were ever successful, with one exception, but they still forced the Prussian government to think about how to handle the Polish minority. Essentially, three different strategies can be observed. Firstly, it was commonly assumed that the desire for an independent Polish state could only be found within the upper classes, so the nobility and the clergy, while the peasants would still be a mainly proto-nationalist society. This was largely true, but still an incredibly simplistic and ignorant assessment on the situation that would later come to have fateful consequences. For the time being, it was argued that all you had to do to keep the Poles at bay would be to keep the peasants away from the influence of the upper classes. The second strategy included a slow and long-term linguistic assimilation. The idea behind this was that speaking a certain language would automatically make you a part of that ethnic group. In the first half of the 19th century, King Wilhelm IV followed a laissez-faire policy of simply letting the Poles assimilate into Prussian society by themselves, in the hopes that adapting to German culture would be attractive enough in itself. This approach had the opposite effect as it paved the way for even more endeavours for independence. In the subsequent decades, more active measures to teach German in school were introduced. The third and the most radical strategy proposed the expulsion or the marginalization of Polish society with the argument that it would be impossible for the Poles to ever get integrated. One proponent of such an idea was the provincial president of Polson, Eugen von Puttkammer, who wrote in 1851, It is and will remain an element hostile to the Prussian government, no matter the form in which it may choose to appear. To conciliate it is impossible. To extirpate it is inhumane as well as impossible. At least it would take generations to do so. Therefore, nothing remains but to confine it energetically to the subordinate position that it deserves. Most politicians in Berlin did not share this sentiment. For the longest time of the 19th century, the whole Polish population was never seen as a national risk in itself, and only so-called radical Polen or radical Poles were considered as such. To summarize it all, the only thing that needed to be done according to the central government was to keep the radicals away from everybody else and to slowly teach the Poles the German language and way of life. In the 1880s, that approach changed. The prime reason for that was the sudden increase of Germans emigrated abroad, especially to the United States. In the first half of the 1880s, more than 860,000 Germans decided to leave their homeland and a very significant portion came from Prussia's eastern provinces. Domestic migration from east to west was also common because of the higher wages and the better living standards. This sparked a discussion at home as some people feared that the departure of so many Germans would have serious economic and cultural consequences, especially in regard to the ethnically mixed areas the so-called Ostflucht or Eastward Flight as it was often called at the time worried many German nationalists. They feared a sudden strengthening of the Polish population caused by the mass immigration of ethnic Germans. There were no numbers that would back up their fears as ethnic censuses hadn't been conducted in Prussia since 1861. So instead, the economist Friedrich Julius Neumann from the University of Tübingen used religious statistics to prove his point. In his 1883 study titled 
Germanization or Polonization, Neumann equates the Catholic with the Polish and the Protestant with the German population while being very aware that this method is flawed to say the least. Using those religious statistics, he comes to the conclusion that the spread of Polishness in Posen and West Prussia is highly likely and that this trend will continue. Quickly, Neumann's findings made their way into popular media. In the magazine Die Gegenwart, the philosopher Eduard von Hartmann finds very strong words. We must Germanize the territory of the Reich. We must absolutely claim the territory for Germanness. We must practice reprisals, i.e. eradicate Slavism within our borders. Furthermore, he demands that all Polish land must be expropriated and turned into German farms, accompanied by purposeful colonization of ethnic Germans. Many voices in politics, the media and in academia conjured up the horror scenario of the Polish flood until that idea reached the ranks of higher politics. Especially the Minister of Culture, Gustav von Gosler, quickly began to lobby in favour of deporting all foreign Poles in Prussia. He managed to convince the Minister of the Interior, Robert von Puttkammer and Bismarck, who had been complaining about Polish migration from Russia and Austria-Hungary for years at this point. In the years after 1885, the state of Prussia deported about 32,000 Poles and Jews that did not own Prussian citizenship. This was hugely unpopular, and in January of 1886, the Reichstag officially condemned the expulsion. However, this had no consequences as the central government had no legal right to interfere in Prussian state politics. While all this was happening, the district president of Bromberg and close friend of Bismarck, Christoph von Tiedemann, wrote a memorandum regarding further policies towards the Polish population. In it, he argues that the rapidly emerging middle class was slowly becoming the most dangerous element of Polish society due to its economic strength. On the other hand, the nobility and the landowners, who were for a long time considered to be the main pillars of Polish nationalism, were finding themselves in big trouble. According to Tiedemann, many nobles were facing financial difficulties and sliding into debt. He then proposed that the Prussian government should take advantage of their vulnerable position by buying up as much Polish land as humanly possible and to settle ethnic Germans on them. This would be a solution for the Ostflucht problem. Bismarck liked this idea, as he considered the nobility to be the backbone of the Polish national movement and thus breaking its back would finally bring peace to the issue. So in January of 1886 he proposed the creation of a state authority tasked with achieving just that. But in order for this new law to be passed through the Prussian Landtag, he needed to secure the votes of the National Liberal Party led by Johannes von Mikkel. And the Liberals followed a vastly different strategy than the Conservatives. The Conservative settlement policy, as proposed by Bismarck, would only have replaced the Polish landowners with German ones. They didn't really care about who worked the land or who lived there, so long as the noblemen weren't Polish. The Liberals, on the other hand, demanded an active settlement policy on divided farmlands. They were pushing for an active Germanization of Prussia's eastern provinces. To summarize it all, while the Prussian Settlement Commission was indeed a proposal pushed forward by Otto von Bismarck, it only became the notorious Germanization instrument that we know it as today due to the National Liberal Party. What even was the Prussian Settlement Commission? It was an institution directly subordinated to the Prussian state ministry and its headquarters was situated in beautiful Posen. It had three main tasks. Firstly, it was tasked with buying up big swaths of land, preferably from Polish landowners. Secondly, it broke up the lands into smaller farms and improved them by draining the fields or by building new roads. Thirdly, it had to attract German settlers and sell the lands back to them. For this task, it had about 100 million marks at its disposal, which was a huge amount of money for that time. It focused most of its efforts on regions in which no ethnic group was clearly in the majority and attempted to tip the balance in favour of the Germans. In order to attract said ethnic Germans, the Prussian Settlement Commission ran a huge advertisement campaign, using free pamphlets that popularised the picture of Prussia's East as the ideal area to reside and work in. It also organized extravagant sightseeing trips around the Posen area to convince potential settlers. But what did the Settlement Commission's work actually look like? This was a question that was even asked by contemporaries such as the journalist Oskar Elsner. In the Berliner Tageblatt, he wrote in the summer of 1903, There is a lot of talk about colonization and its effects, 
but little or nothing is generally known about how it is carried out in practice. Even educated people in Posen, the seat of the Settlement Commission, have told me that they know next to nothing about this matter, which is particularly important for the province of Posen. This prompted me to visit a few of the new colonies. To figure out what was actually going on, he hops on a train and travels about 16 kilometers to the colony of Golenchevo, or Golenhofen as it would later be known. Golenhofen was a small village that was largely built on a formerly Polish estate, which was acquired by the Settlement Commission in 1901. Formerly there had been a small and dilapidated village, but it would get completely transformed after the purchase. What makes Golenhofen so special is that it was deliberately designed to be a model village to showcase the success of the Settlement Commission. It was often presented to journalists, politicians, government officials, NGOs and simple tourists. For this purpose it was built completely by the Settlement Commission with some very interesting architectural features. The main architect of the Settlement Commission, Paul Fischer, was firmly convinced that the construction of Golenhofen should not be conducted by the settlers themselves, which is what had usually been the case in other German colonies, as he wanted Golenhofen to be as impressive as possible. By looking at this map, one can tell that Golenhofen was essentially designed as a street village with very closely laid out farmsteads. At the crossroads with another street leading from north to south, a market square was built, surrounded with everything a village might possibly need. The most recognizable building was the Gemeindehaus, which served both as a school building and as a prayer hall. The teacher's flat was also situated there, alongside a telephone. The first school year began in 1905, and 39 children found themselves in a colourful classroom with a sign above the door telling them to obey their teachers and listen to them. Every two weeks, the priest from Rokietnica would visit Golenhofen and hold church service. In front of the school you would have found a decorative fountain with four different statues that had been taken from the former Polish estate. Other buildings along the market square include a bake and wash house with its own bathing room and a guest house which included an inn, hotel rooms and a small shop. In the summer of 1904 Golenhofen received its own train station on the line between Posen and Schneidemühl to motivate potential settlers and to really convey this image of a modern German village. Building Golenhofen was an expensive venture. In total, the Settlement Commission paid about 443,000 marks, with each farmstead costing between 9,000 and 12,000 marks. One reason for those high costs is that the buildings in this model village had to be of exemplary and outstanding quality. So, compared to other German colonies in the province of Posen, the average house in Golenhofen would have been of much higher quality. Paul Fischer himself writes about this, even if he still claims that the buildings were only appropriate for their purpose. However, whether settlers are allowed to build on their own, quite modest artistic achievements usually come to light. Raw brick buildings of the most sober type, the term raw should be underlined, form the rule. The basic rule for the architects of the settlement buildings should always be to limit the internal and external design of their works to what is appropriate. In Golenhofen, every house was unique and was built in different styles broadly resembling Germanish architecture. One could find architecture inspired by similar buildings from various German regions like Lower Saxony, Baden, Swabia, Saxony, Thuringia and many more. The colours that were most commonly used for the houses were black, white and red, symbolising the flag of the Kaiserreich. Most of the time, the architectural style of the houses did not represent the actual regions where the settlers came from. The settlers themselves also came from various regions of the empire, even if people from the western or southern parts were generally preferred. This was bluntly stated in a report released by the Settlement Commission. In particular, the West and South Germans have proven themselves to be efficient. They brought with them an advanced form of farming, superior intelligence, a wealth of knowledge and experience in agriculture and livestock breeding, a strong economic sense, a sophisticated culture, and a certain level of prosperity. On the other hand, so-called Rückwanderer, or ethnic Germans from Russia or the Habsburg Empire, had a very rough time. Especially those from Russia often had to put up with stereotypes. They were famed as lazy, unclean, wasteful, bigoted and much, much more. The reason why they still made up about one quarter of all settlers in Polson was that the influx of settlers from Western Germany was not as big as initially expected. 
in Gohlenhofen die Settlers Came from Baden, Brandenburg, die Rhineland, die Duchy of Anhalt, Silesia and Lower Saxony. Interestingly, many villages were ethnic Germans that emigrated from the Russian Empire, particularly from the Azov region in modern-day Ukraine. Some more settlers came from the Habsburg Empire, particularly from Hungary. One of them was a man called Heinrich Ava. He had a long journey behind him. Heinrich was the descendant of Swabian settlers in a small village called Semlag in the Kingdom of Hungary, modern-day Romania. In 1890, he, his wife and their four children emigrated to Dobanovci in Serbia. Fifteen years later, they embarked on another journey, this time to Gohlenhofen. There, they felt at home instantly, because they quickly met other settlers who also came from Semlak. Heinrich would lead a remarkable life in this new village. He was a wealthy farmer and became the de facto leader of Gohlenhofen. In collective memory, the family is often remembered as the rich Avas. Gohlenhofen's intended purpose as a propaganda village seems to have worked, all things considered. In many articles, certain writers like to point out how horrible everything must have been under Polish control and how much the area has been improved since the construction of the village. Figure 7 shows what it used to look like here under Polish rule. Even at the beginning of this year, this half-broken building, which has now been repaired, was home to Polish labourers who apparently could not part with the old glory. An important piece of German cultural work lies in this village complex, the only one of its kind in Germany to date the full value of which can only be recognized when its exemplary effect has been realized. Even abroad, the reception seems to have been largely positive. In 1906, the French journalist Jules Huré arrived in Gohlenhofen. In his books, he dedicates a whole chapter to the Gohlenhofen settlement. The train stopped at Golenchebo, station point, a stop in the middle of fields. The state wanted to make a model village here. Its architects therefore endeavored to build small, Chafel farms of varied appearance surrounded by flower gardens. Every German provincial style is represented here. Nothing has been spared to make Golenchevo a model village. Overall, its farms are indeed enlarged reproductions of the pasteboard models admired at architectural exhibitions. And the interiors would also deserve the first awards from the most demanding jury. On the other hand, the Poles were largely unsympathetic to the Golenhofen project. In 1903, during the village's construction, a Polish carriage driver commented, I would also like to acquire an estate, but the law does not allow it. I'm Polish, even if I'm a good Prussian subject. I have seen Golenchevo develop. It will have 40 houses, 20 of which are finished so far, all very nice, but it seems to me that they were built somewhat lightly. Criticism also hailed from Polish representatives in the Prussian Landtag, such as Zygmunt Jambowski, who said during a speech, If you want to study the construction styles of German farmhouses, go to Gohlenhofen. But is it allowed to artificially construct such aesthetically beautiful villages with state money? But however beautiful it looks from the outside, and although French journalists are taken there to show them the great German cultural work, when you go there in winter and talk to the colonists, you realize that the government has only built beautiful summer flats, which are not suitable for the winter at all. To answer the question why the settlement project failed in its entirety, we need to do some maths. Between the founding of the commission and the outbreak of the First World War, the Royal Prussian Settlement Commission spent 955 million marks and settled about 22,000 German families in Posen and West Prussia. The exact number of settlers is not recorded, so let's broadly assume that each family consisted of a mum, a dad and three children, so five people in total. This would result in a grand total of 110,000 new German settlers, at the cost of 8,700 marks each. Of course, this was nowhere near enough to compensate for the Polish majority in those regions. In the province of Polson alone, the Poles outnumbered the Germans by about 350,000. If that number had somehow stayed static, it would have cost around 3 billion marks to achieve something that would even closely resemble an equilibrium. This is still a very unrealistic scenario as the initial problems of a higher Polish birth rate and a high German migration rate still persisted. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that even if the war hadn't broken out, the whole project would still have failed miserably. But what were the main challenges that it faced? For starters, you had the strong opposition of Prussia's Poles that set in almost immediately after the commission's founding. In October of 1886, the Bank Siemski was founded by investors from a mostly landowning background. 
this bank had the task of granting loans to indebted Polish landowners and to prevent the acquisition of their lands. In some cases, the settlement commission was even beat at its own game. In 1888, in the small village of Pinschin in West Prussia, a highly indebted German landowner was financially struggling and was therefore in danger of having to give up his land. The Prussian Settlement Commission refused to buy up his land, as the owner was German. So instead an agent from Danzig appeared and offered to buy it in the name of the previously unknown Ackerbau und Kreditverein. Due to the German name of the organization, the administration in Preuße Stargard didn't suspect anything and allowed the purchase to happen. You can probably imagine the shock when it turned out that the founders of this strange organization actually turned out to be Polish and urged Polish investors to invest into a potential settlement for Polish settlers. Inspired by this, the Bank Ziemski opened up subsidiaries in Tarn, Oberbock, Tuchel, Wreschen and many other places. They mainly bought up lands from Polish landowners, but managed to prevent them from falling into German hands. Due to this fierce competition, the Settlement Commission was forced to buy up largely German lands after 1898. After the turn of the century, more than 80% of all estate lands were purchased from Germans. And the reason why it cost so much money is that this state purchase of lands created an environment with an artificial demand, which increased speculation. As such, the Settlement Commission paid much, much more than the lands were actually worth. Between 1890 and 1906, the price of the lands had increased by a bit more than 100%, and for the most part, the commission more than overpaid the landowner's debts. Because of this, the historian Hans Ulrich Wehler came to the following conclusion. By spending almost a billion gold marks in 1914, the commission acted on a grand scale as a bailout company for numerous often indebted landowners, who were able to sell their estates at unusually high prices by threatening to sell them to the financially strong Polish cooperatives. Despite the failure and its massive costs, the Prussian government pursued the settlement policy until the First World War. After the war ended, the Greater Poland Uprising brought Poznania and most of West Prussia under Polish control. It probably won't surprise you to find out that the Royal Prussian Settlement Commission was no longer wanted. In 1919, all the Germans working there were fired. Formerly, the commission still existed in Berlin, but in 1920, the Prussian State Assembly decided to finally disband it. Today, the opulent main quarters are a part of the University of Poznan. Now, finally, what happened to the lovely village of Gohlenhofen? After the Great War, the Greater Poland Uprising brought Greater Poland under Polish control, including Gohlenhofen. Sources regarding this particular time period are very rare, but it is probably safe to assume that the mostly German-speaking villages were not too thrilled about their fate. This is reflected in the fact that already in the early 1920s, most settlers sold off their houses and moved to Germany. Some more were forced to leave as everyone that settled in Poznania after 1908 had their right to stay revoked, and regaining that residency permit was not easy. Of the 45 German families, around 17 decided to and were allowed to stay and obtained Polish citizenship. All things considered, the relations between the remaining Germans and the new Polish neighbours were alright. The village life in the interwar years was also quite rich. A Polish volunteer fire brigade was founded in 1921, and one year later a local agricultural association was established. To commemorate the 10-year anniversary of the rebirth of an independent Polish state, a statue of the Virgin Mary was unveiled in the market square. The occupation of German troops after 1939 was brutal, and some of the Polish inhabitants got expelled. Some more got killed, or deported to concentration camps. The houses were then given to Black Sea Germans or to Germans living in Golenchewa. Then, in one single day in winter of 1945, the authorities evacuated almost all Germans except for a couple. After the Second World War ended, all traces of the formerly German village, including the fountain in the market square, got erased. It would take multiple decades for a historical evaluation of Golenchewa's unique history to occur. One of the people who is responsible for bringing this history to light is Grzegorz Grupinski, who inspired me to make this video and provided me with countless sources to work with and gave me much needed advice. So thank you very much for that. He is a local to Golenchevo and he created a magnificent website on which you can find countless articles covering every little detail of Golenchevo's fascinating past. So if you speak Polish or German or know how to use the translation tool, be sure to visit the website.
you'll find the link in the description. Alright then, thank you for watching and hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode. If you did, a like and a subscribe would be well appreciated. A special and huge thank you goes out to my kind supporters on Ko-Fi, namely A Cup of Tea, Tristan Kriegsmann, Ryan Layton and Philip Marchewka. You are absolute legends. Anyway, have a very nice rest of the day and goodbye.